happy Wednesday, everyone. Welcome back. Please pick up your clicker card if you have not. Uh, first thing that I want to show you is I had a lot of fun looking at all uh, the pictures uh, that you folks came up with for Lab Zero. There's a uh, gallery linked from the course calendar. So we had uh, uh, funky faces, solar system, a uh, number of uh, snowmen, cats, football, a government bird, uh, <laughs> geometric designs, landscapes, fractals, uh, anti-rain propaganda, uh, rendering of Anderson, snowmen, circles, uh, skulls, a house, among us, baseball, faces, anyway, nice, nice gallery all put together, great work on Lab Zero. Uh, I hope uh, many of you have gotten started on uh, the lab, if not, please uh, do so as soon as possible. Uh, are there any questions on the lab or, or the quiz? Anything we've been uh, looking at to get us started? Yes. Yeah. Ah, yes, thank you for reminding me. I should have sent out a link. There is something called a live share for Visual Studio. Uh, and that will let two people simultaneously edit uh, a file. Very useful for working with a partner, so thank you for, for asking me. Uh, I will uh, later today send out a link to a sort of how-to guide uh, for using Live Share. Other questions? Uh, reminder that the quiz one do 9 p.m. tonight. Uh, one note that I have found that for uh, in Moodle, particularly if you copy and paste uh, text from somewhere else, it may include invisible like spacing stuff at the end. And this can throw off its answer matching like with the first question about putting down a for loop. Uh, so, for that first quiz question that asks you to write a Java style uh, for loop, if it's telling you that the answer is wrong, but all the text is blue, and you're pretty sure it's right, it's probably just Moodle being dumb, I will be checking that question manually. So, uh, please don't spend hours uh, uh, trying to... Um, Get Moodle to, to be happy on that on that question. All right. So let's do a little bit of review. And first up. I have a bit of code here. Uh, the start of a class definition for a bank account class. Uh, it has two instance variables or fields. An instance variable and a field are just two terms for the same thing, a string and a double. And defined here as a constructor to initialize those fields. So among these four answers down here, uh, and imagine each one is all on its own line. The, the fact that these are spread across two lines is not relevant. Um, but one of those is not a valid constructor call. 
uh, and the other three are. So take a moment to identify the one that is not valid. Uh, most of us are, are thinking A, that's great. This is the one that uh, won't compile. Uh, can someone share with us why answer this, uh, this one in, in A is not going to compile? Rebecca. Exactly. The, the constructor defines what type each of the parameters have to, has to be. The first one has to be a string, second one has to be a double, and that's not what is happening on A here. We're giving it a number first and a string second that won't match. Compiler will say these types don't match. Any questions on this? Questions about the, the other ones? Other answers there? Right Since 12 is in the string box, would the computer automatically convert it to a string, or is that? That's a good question. Will the uh, will Java automatically convert this number 12 into a string? Uh, it will not. All right. Will will complain that that uh, it's that you're not giving it a string. Other questions. Go ahead. Uh, that's a great question. Is it uh, in these ones that I'm saying are valid? Uh, this one is a double. These other two are integers. Is that okay? Uh, Java will automatically convert integers into doubles. Uh, so you can give it 0 or 12, and it will turn it into 12.0 and 0.0. .0. Does it work the other way around if you have a parameter that's an integer and you put a double in? So that I would need to test. So let us do just that. So if I make a test class and I make a main method and another method foo that takes in a, let's say, a long, or no, let's make it an, an, an x, turn x times 2, and then what if I was trying to print foo of zero, uh, 1.345? Save this to test.java. Ah, and it is giving me, oh, uh, let's make this an int. It is saying uh, I can't give it a double where it wants an int. But one thing is an int and a double are different sizes. Like a double uses twice as much memory as an int. So what if I made this a long? Made it return along. Uh, still doesn't like turning along into a double. But because that will lose information. To turn a to turn a, a, a double into a long, we'd have to throw away the fraction part. And Java is not going to let us do that accidentally. Uh, whereas going the other way, going from Um, if I make this static, uh, going from an integer to a double, we're not losing any information, so that's fine. Does that make sense? Questions on that? Okay. One other... Exercise here. So here I have some code. Uh, is that too small? Turn the lights off. Uh, oh yeah, good, good idea. 
to see what it looks like. Okay. So here I have some code. And I'm asking in this code for you to count how many fields are there, how many methods are there, how many objects are there. And that's what these uh, numbers in, in these uh, different answers are, number of fields, number of methods, number of objects in that order. So take a moment, try and count up how many of each of those there are involved in this code. All right, some votes for, for A, B, and C. One, one person thinking D, please discuss with your neighbors how you're counting these up, what each of these terms, field, method, object, means. We're now thinking it's just A or B. I'm going to argue that it is C. And so because I'm I'm playing a little 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 trick on you. So let's start with fields. What uh, what are the two fields in this code? Steven? X and Y. Yes, these are our the data that's inside of our object, that's our x and y. Those variables defined inside uh, a class, those are fields or, or instance variables. How about our methods? What are our two methods? Anybody? Well, public point is a method, and I'm guessing the second one is the public static void main, but I'm not sure. Exactly. We have any time we define a function inside a class, that is a method. Some methods are kind of serve a special role, and in case in this case both of these do. The capital P point method. What is what is our special name for this kind of method? It's right. Exactly. And we can see inside main this constructor method being used as part of creating a new point. Main is if we were to run this code, like run this Java file, it would run, it would do this main function. And that's kind of what main special role is it's what uh, what gets run when you execute the program which is why in lab one the main method that's provided to you is the code that actually kind of prints out stuff asks for the players moves runs the game because that's what starts uh, running when you, when you run the, the coin script Java file so now The uh, tricky bit, one of the objects is P, that point we're constructing in main. The other object, args, that array of strings that's the parameter to main, that is an object. <laughs> and so it was a second object hiding hiding in this code. What are your questions on that? Does this make sense? How do uh, So, fair question. What makes args an object? Uh, what? There were two kinds of, of data that we have in Java. There are objects and there are primitives. Double Lowercase d double, that's an example of a primitive. All right, no more falling asleep. <laughs> Tired of this. Stay away. Okay. Double, that's a primitive. Anything that's not a primitive, and in particular, anything that, whose type is capitalized, that is an object. So, 
capital S string is an object, and also all arrays are objects. So for primitives, we just have int, long, float, double, boolean, char. Those six. That's it. Everything else is an object. So what's the value of R? Like, what do, what do you like print it out? So, args in the made method is an array of strings that are the command line arguments that were put in when you ran the program. So, we're generally not going to to mess with these uh, in this course, but just to Uh, by the way, if you hit uh, toggle line comment, which on Mac is uh, command slash, that will toggle to a comment any lines you have selected uh, or whatever line your cursor is on. It uh, can be pretty useful. But I can print a few of these args in this test.java and I need to do this from the terminal because that's what command line arguments mean. They mean arguments put into to the terminal. So if I run Java C on test.java it will compile this and I can see that there is now a test.class that got produced when I compiled my code and then if I say Java test, that will run the program. If I run the program, it immediately says array index out of bounds exception because I didn't give it any command line arguments and so it tried to get the first string in this array. There wasn't any such array element and it produced this error which it tells me happened on line seven of test.java, which right there. So, if I then give it an argument, now it has one command line argument, it prints out hello, but when it tries to get the one at index one, we hit an error. So if I provide kind of three separate arguments to running this Java file, those are put in this args array. So for a kind of general purpose Java programming, if you want the user to be able to run a program and kind of give some inputs uh, every time uh, that they run it, these command line arguments are useful for that. Um, there are other ways to get inputs, such as reading a file, or like we're seeing in lab one, kind of asking the user to enter something, and then in the terminal, the user types something in and, hit, and, and hits enter. And we'll, we'll mostly use those. We won't use this command line arguments, but every Java main method has to have this sort of parameter just in case the, the program was, was run with command line arguments. Other questions? All right. So I want to finish up a few things. Uh, with object-oriented programming. So the first is I want to say a little bit more about static. So uh, if I had a um, Maybe I, I want to make a class that just has a bunch of useful kind of mathematical functions in it. And so one of these is uh, 
a method that's going to compute the area of a circle for me. And it's going to take in the radius of that circle. So who can remind me of the, the formula for the area of a circle? Sam. Yeah, we'll have pi times radius times radius. That gives the area of the circle. So If I in, let's say, some other file want to use this circle area function to get the area of a circle, and I want to say uh, use it to tell me the area of a circle of, of radius 10. So the way, as I have written it here, in order to use the method of a class, I have to first create an instance of that class. I have to first uh, create an object so that I can call that method with an actual object of that class. So I would need to say something like math m equals new math and then say m dot circle area to be able to use this method. But this is a little clunky. Like there's this math class is not storing any data. There's nothing about this circle area that relates to a particular instance of the math class. It just takes in an, uh, an input and does something that only relates to that input. So it sort of stands by itself. It doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't interact with other parts of, of the object. And so if I were to make it a static method, I said last time that static means it is not tied to a particular object. It's a method that's associated with the class overall. It doesn't, I don't need to create an instance of uh, the object to use it. So that would mean instead of doing this, I could just say the name of the class math dot circle area 10. So I wouldn't need to do this first step of creating a math object and then call circle area with that particular object. The static method I can just call by itself, just saying the math dot circle area. We've actually seen uh, uh, we, we've seen and used a, a number of static methods already. Whenever we had standard draw dot something, or we saw some examples with standard in, lab one suggests you use standard random. These are all implemented like this static circle area, where we can just have the name of the class and then some method that we can use without having to create, say, a standard draw object. Okay. When would you not want to use static? So, uh, excellent question. When to use static, when not to use static, uh, there are a lot of subtleties in there, so I can't give you kind of a single rule to follow 
in all circumstances. Um, but, and, and most of the work that we will do in this class will not involve static methods because they're sort of a, a, a special case. Like we'll see, we'll see the static main method all the time. It's most classes will have one, uh, but besides that, not much. But one way to think about it is any method that interacts with a field of a class can't be static because the value of that field is going to be associated with a particular object, whereas a static method isn't associated with a particular object. So to go back to the, uh, the bank account example that we looked at earlier, we wanted a method to add an amount to the current balance or subtract some amount from the current balance. Uh, those would have to be non-static. Those would have to be just normal methods because they would need to modify the balance uh, variable inside the class. Uh, a common time that static might come up is if you want a method that produces a new instance, uh, produces a new object of that class. So if we had our uh, point class and I wanted a method random point. Oh, I need to give this a return value. I want to have a method that returns a new random point. It looks something like return new point and then maybe I'm using standard random dot uniform, which gives me a random double between 0 and 1. This method, which just kind of produces a new object of the point class, this would be a method that I put inside my class point so that I could use it I could just say point dot random point in order to, this would let me kind of get that random point where I wouldn't have to kind of copy paste this new point of standard uniform everywhere that I needed a random point. I defined this static method that I could use to do that. This would be static because, again, it doesn't modify x or y. It doesn't use anything about some particular point. It's just something the point class can do. Does that make sense? Other questions? I would say if static seems sort of weird and confusing, that's to be expected. It is weird and confusing and sort of uh, is pretty different from how we're usually going to think about objects where we have data inside the object and then methods that interact with that data. And so for that reason, as I said, we'll, uh, static won't come up that much in the course, but it is something that, that Java uh, can do and that kind of as someone that comes out of this course knowing Java, you'll be expected to at least have a general idea of, of have heard of static and, and seen some examples of it. All right. Other 
Uh, last, no, object oriented uh, thing that I wanted to make sure to mention was the idea of inheritance, which is which is this idea that we can define a class that is going to borrow all the public fields and public methods of some other class. And uh, in code uh, that's posted for, uh, for Monday, uh, there are uh, a set of files uh, that define different shapes. And of when we're thinking about shapes or, or graphics, this is a, uh, uh, a time when this idea of inheritance uh, becomes pretty useful. So we might define a shape class that says, any shape, you should be able to get its position. You should be able to set its position to a particular point, and you should be able to get its area. And we might say, There is then a polygon class that extends shape, which is how we say one class inherits from another. And when we say polygon extends shape, that means it's going to inherit, it's going to get the get position method the set position method and the get area method is going to get exactly those that were defined in the shape class. And if I had also defined shape to have a field, it's a point that I called position, polygon gets that as well. And so if I want my polygon class to just be able to do all the things that a shape can do, Putting extend shape, shape saved me the work of kind of redoing all of these things that I already did in the shape class. And then I might add a get vertexes method that's specific to a polygon that wouldn't apply to all shapes, but that would give me like a list of the, uh, of the points uh, that, that make up the polygon. I could, yeah, Christopher. Um, so is implements kind of the same thing as extends in Clipper? I guess what's the difference? Yes, great question. We've also seen implements. I will get there in just a moment. Wait, is it getting all of them or just the ones that it chooses to use? For uh, it is inherent. It is getting all the public ones, whether it wants them or not. And so this is one way in which you can prevent inheritance, because anything that you make private, any field or any method that is made private, will not be inherited if that is extended. So I might say. Okay, there's a circle that extends shape. 
and maybe a rectangle that extends polygon. So I can build up what is called a class hierarchy, which is not of uh, the uh, uh, this is a, a not not socialism uh, one one uh, We have shape at the top, and from that we had polygon that inherited everything from shape, and we had circle that inherited everything from shape, and then we had. Rectangle that inherited everything from polygon, which would include whatever polygon inherited from shape. So rectangle would have everything that was in that was public in shape. And uh, this relationship of say polygon and shape, we would say shape is the superclass. And polygon is the subclass, which is, is the terminology for the, the, the direction of this relationship. So shape would be the superclass of polygon, and polygon would be the subclass of shape. What are your questions on this? This is pretty dense stuff, so what, what could I explain more? Yes. Can you repeat what you said since you're talking a little bit about like private methods, so it doesn't, so shape as a private method, like I wouldn't get that. That's exactly it. That inheritance only applies to public fields and methods. So if shape had any private method, any private field, that would never be inherited. Other questions? All right, so now to the idea that uh, Chris got it with interfaces. An interface is a uh, is a clan. Well, an interface just determines a set of methods that a class has to implement. So I might say that shape is, I'd say, public interface rather than public class shape. And then in shape, say, in this shape interface, say, OK, there's a public get position that returns a point. There is a public set position that doesn't return anything. And there's a public get area that returns a double. And this would be the entire content of the interface definition, that I would just give the start of the method, and then instead of an open curly brace, just put a semicolon. And so what this interface is doing is saying any class that says it's a shape better have these public methods in order to meet the definition of what it means to be a shape. And so instead of extends, I would say polygon implement shape, which now says instead of inheriting some existing definition of get area, implement shape means, OK, polygon better have a get area method. It needs to have a set position method. It needs to have 
A get position method. And if it doesn't have if if it doesn't have each of these, if I don't put those implementations in here, this Polygon class will not compile because I've told Java Polygon is going to implement all the methods in the shape interface. This is useful because with this shape interface, and this is, you can look at the flying shapes example code to see this in action. But having this interface lets me have an array of shapes where the actual objects could be polygons or circles or anything that implements the shape interface. And because all of these objects implement the shape interface, I know that they have the methods in that interface. And in lab one, you are writing the coin strip class, which implements this two-player game interface, which itself uh, says, okay, here are three methods that any sort of two-player game class needs to have. Let's see. Um, so what's the difference between that and interface since an interface is also getting the methods and stuff from um, the other class? Yeah, so the uh, question is, what is the difference between an, an kind of this uh, interface and the sort of inheritance we were talking about before? Uh, and an interface, the difference is an interface does not provide an actual implementation of any of the methods. It just says, okay, something that's a shape will have a get position method, but it's not defined here. We're just setting up the expectation that a shape has a get position method. And so then any class that implements that interface must provide actual code for for the methods in that interface. It, Is there a reason you would like use an interface and then implement it rather than extend it? So uh, the syntax is if this is an interface, we have implement, implements. If this is a class, we have extends. Okay. So uh, uh, we wouldn't kind of use extends with an interface. Um, and uh, so I have this uh, shapes uh, fun time uh, code, uh, which uses this. Which, which kind of uses this sort of hierarchy where shape is an interface. And it lets me have this array of random shapes. Some of them are going to be circles, some of them are going to be rectangles. But because both circle and rectangle implement the shape interface, it, le it lets me have all those objects together in a single array. And in this code, what I want to do is then to loop through this array and sort of move all of the shapes on the screen. And so I don't have it here, but uh, so because all shapes have a set position and a get position, whether the shape is a circle or a rectangle, I can get its position and then set its new position to current position plus some little change. And so by setting this up, I can sort of have the same code deal with different kinds of shapes because they all have a common set of methods uh, that, uh, that can be called with them. But because they're separate classes, they can each define, oh, to draw a rectangle, you make a four-sided uh, shape to draw a circle. It looks like a circle so that there's kind of different code inside each, but there's this common interface that they share that lets a single uh, uh, single piece of code kind of work with them all 
uh, in the same way. Rebecca. So does the polygon that influence the shape, does it have to use all of the um, pieces that's in the interface? Yes. When you implement an interface, you have to provide definitions for every single uh, method the interface specifies. If that wasn't true, then we couldn't assume that rectangle and circle would all share the shape methods if they were allowed to leave one out. But because they're required to have all of them, it makes it so we, can, we just know that all of these classes that implement shape will have all the shape methods. Jake. Um, for the constrict.java, it seems like all the methods that implement the two-player game have like at override above them. Is that something we have to do, or is that just for clarity? Uh, that's a good uh, uh, good question. Um, in coin strip, uh, in the the starter code, all of the um, uh, all of the the methods that are that it's getting from. Uh, here we are. All of the methods that it's getting uh, from the interface, it says at override. Uh, this is uh, basically a clarity thing to, to make sure that you label, okay, these are the methods that are coming from a class we're extending or an interface we're implementing, and we're providing new or, or definitions for them in this class. Other questions? All right. I think that means it is time to talk about James K. Polk, our 11th president. Uh, elected in 1844, uh, Polk was uh, a Democrat, so we're not uh, uh, we're done with the, the Whig Party for for the moment. Though uh, I don't think uh, history is quite quite done with him yet. Uh, Polk was a, a, a protege of Andrew Jackson, and Polk made basically two promises. That I'm going to take a bunch of land from Mexico, and I'm going to run, and I'm going to serve for one term. And he did indeed do both of those things. He provoked a war with Mexico, annexed Texas and uh, territory west of there, and then didn't run for re-election. Uh, so, in some ways, he's he's remembered as uh, uh, for that. Um, the person that he beat as a, uh, in 1844, as a brief aside, is uh, this fellow, Henry Clay, prominent Whig, uh, in some ways uh, one of the most uh, notable uh, and influential politicians of this, this era. Henry Clay knew that he was super notable and influential, and so he kept running for president. Um, and I think this time in 1844 is either the fourth or fifth attempt at becoming president, all of them failed. So, but a uh, bit of a disappointment for for Henry Clay, um, uh, major figure in, in in Congress for many decades, but never got to be president. So the the last thing I'll say about Polk, um, he uh, uh, he was a a slave owner, and. Uh, believed in a, the expansion of U.S. territory and was seen as supporting the expansion of slavery in the U.S. and in this way kind of contributed to uh, this, what was becoming uh, by far the most uh, contentious issue in U.S. politics at the time, which was would new territory allow slavery or not? And a couple Decades, this will bring uh, bring the U.S. to to civil war, and so Polk's also kind of remembered as for his his uh, uh, role in in that as well. All right, back to 
data structures. So last uh, last time, I believe Sammy asked a question. which I might reframe as how big, when we, when we make an array, how big should we make the array? And the scenario might be have some file and we're, and that has data in it, and we want to read numbers from that file. We don't know how many numbers are in that file. There might be a lot of them. And and we want to store these numbers. Uh, in some sort of uh, structure that our program can work with. So we're going to read them in for the file, from a file and we're going to put them uh, into, into some structure. And And so far, the only thing that we've seen in Java that can uh, store some uh, a group of data is our trusty array. So what I'd like for you to do is with your neighbors, try and brainstorm uh, different ways that we might answer or approach the question of how big do we make the array that we're going to store this data in. All right, so Someone share uh, share an idea that came up in your discussion, or a question, or or problem that you were thinking about in your discussion. Huh. Is there a way to like have it check for an error? Like if you tried to enter too many numbers into an array, and then have it just create a new array and dump those numbers there. So uh, you're suggesting we. So if if our array runs out of room, make a bigger one. That's an interesting idea. When we make a bigger one, what steps other than making the bigger array, is there anything that we would we would need to do? Yeah, Peter. Exactly. We would need to copy over all the things that were in the old smaller array that we're getting rid of to this new bigger one in order to uh, be able to eventually end up with an array that has all the things in it. Other thoughts? Ideas that came up? Steven. First count all the numbers in the file and set that number equal to a variable and create an array that size. Yeah, that would be another approach. 
if we read through this file twice, the first time we can just count how many numbers are in there, then we know how big an array to make. So that, that could be uh, a reasonable approach, but it does rely on the fact that there is a way that we can determine, that we can count ahead of time how many numbers there are. But if we're in a situation where, uh, let's say, the user, the, the human at the computer was entering kind of numbers one at a time or in large groups at a time, uh, there wouldn't be any way for us to count ahead of time. And we need some way to be flexible as the program was running to accommodate uh, more data than maybe we originally had guessed. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> well, this is not a very smart approach, but given the hypothetical situation, you can make a, an array that has the size of the biggest size you can make it. And then after putting in whatever you need to put in, you just strip the thing. Yes, we could make the biggest, hugest array ever and just it. I mean, if that's not big enough, then, you know, uh, maybe this, this, this situation has, has more problems. Um, yeah, so this is a, a nice, simple kind of brute force. We're just going to make the array so big, can't possibly fail, like Titanic, ship can't sink. Um, uh, but... If our file has all of 10 numbers in it, we're going to have a lot of memory that we're using for this big, huge array um, that uh, isn't actually being used. So this first approach, where when we run out of room, we're just going to make a bigger array and copy over the old one. Uh, this is... The, uh, this is kind of the core idea behind the standard answer to this sort of question. That if we have an array that does this, what we have is an extensible array. That is an array that we can grow and maybe even shrink as the program runs in order to accommodate however much or, or little data there actually is. So just have a, a, a few minutes. So I want to sketch out a few parts of how an array like uh, a class like this might be implemented. So Java calls this sort of structure uh, an array list. I'm going to make one that is just for integers. So I'm going to define an array int list. And it's going to have two private fields. going to have an array of, of integers. This will uh, uh, be the array that's actually uh, holding the data that I'm, I'm putting in here. So this class is, is ba basically has a, a kind of normal fixed size array underneath, and we're going to kind of build a data structure around that that is extensible, that can, can grow and shrink. And we're also going to need a count, the to keep track of the current number of elements actually in our array int list, because that could be smaller than the number of spots we have in our data array. So I can have a constructor 
that starts out the array, internal array, with 10, uh, 10 spots in it. And we start out with no, no actual uh, data. Uh, no, no ints have actually been uh, added to our uh, array list. to add an integer to our uh, to our array list and so uh, I'm just going to take in an integer with the idea that that should be added onto the end of whatever integers are currently uh, currently in the array list and so uh, we can use the count as the index of the first empty spot in our internal array. Is that the start count is zero, that's the first index in data, and it currently has, we haven't put an integer in there yet, so we could put an integer into index zero, and then add one to the count. So now we've, if we say add five, we've now made the first element of this array five, and the count now says we have one thing in here. And the next time we add it, we'd add it at index one, which is the second spot in the array. Now, just these two lines isn't doing this if we're out of room, make the array bigger. And so we're going to have a private method called ensure capacity that is going to do this step where if data dot length is less than the amount, the number of spots we want to make sure that we have, this is where we would make that bigger array and then copy over the old array to the new bigger one. And so this way, every time we went to add something to our array in list, we first, if necessary, kind of make our internal array that we're using to actually store the data bigger, and then we'll have enough room to insert a new element. So that's all we have time for today. We'll pick up uh, uh, and kind of finish up this extensible array on Friday. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Keep working on lab one. Uh, I have uh, lab hours in Olin 310, uh, 7.30, 9.30 tomorrow night. Uh, and I'll see you on Friday.